There's a story, you might have heard this story before. A hog and a hen were sharing the same barnyard. They heard about a church's program to feed the hungry. Being very compassionate and loving animals, the hog and the hen discussed how they could help. The hen said, I've got it. We'll provide bacon and eggs for the church to feed those needy people. The hog thought about it for a few minutes and said, there's one concern I have with your bacon and egg solution. For you, it only requires a contribution, but for me, it will mean total commitment. So in case you haven't guessed already, the scripture readings today are giving us time to consider discipleship. Elijah as commanded by God, anoints Elisha to follow God and call, follow God's call to succeed Elijah as a prophet. Elisha follows God's call and learns from Elijah. He becomes a disciple. In the gospel, Jesus points out with intensity the cost of becoming one of his disciples. So let us look at the gospel again. Jesus sends some of his disciples ahead of him as messengers to the Samaritan town to let them know that Jesus will be coming there as he is on his way to Jerusalem to proclaim to them the kingdom of God. Well, there's a story here. When the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians a long time ago, the Assyrians exiled the leaders of the Israelites and inhabited the land. And those Israelites who remained eventually intermarried, and with the Assyrians, they also started to worship some of their gods. Over time, those in the north were called Samaritans. The Jews from the southern kingdom of Judah looked down on the Samaritans. When the Judeans themselves returned from the Babylonian exile, and were working to reestablish the temple, the Samaritans offered to help, but they were summarily rejected. And there are more such stories that could be told. So you can understand that there was quite a bit of animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. So when the Samaritans heard that Jesus' messengers from Jesus' messengers, that he was on his way to Jerusalem, not just coming to visit them, he was on a stop on his way to Jerusalem. So they did not welcome Jesus. Then there were the two disciples, James and John, who had the nickname Sons of Thunder. They heard about the Samaritans rejecting Jesus. They wanted to have the village destroyed by fire and brimstone. Jesus used their suggestion of violent retribution as a teaching moment for a disciple and rebuked James and John. After all, Jesus did already tell them that they were to love their enemies and that God would render judgment, not them. They should follow Jesus and just shake the dust of that town off of their feet and go forward to the next village. As Jesus and those traveling with him continue on their way to Jerusalem, three men in the group follow Jesus. They come forward. And all, in all three cases, Jesus uses their interaction to underscore the importance and the commitment attached to being a disciple. The first traveler must have been so moved and inspired by what he had experienced in being with Jesus. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus let him know how difficult that path will be. But the Son of Man has nowhere to hang his head. Jesus might have well have said, By following me, you will suffer many hardships, you will be homeless. You'll be dismissed, you'll be rejected, you'll be tortured, and possibly killed because my way is not of this world. 
The second traveler was actually called by Jesus to follow him. But this man, the willing, asked if he could go home and bury his father. Jesus said, Let the dead bury their own dead. Ouch. And then he told him to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to take a moment to address the elephant in the room. I don't know about all of you, but wow. Let the dead bury their own dead? That statement seems so out of character for Jesus. One thought that came to me was maybe Jesus was just trying to get our attention by saying something so outrageous we would have to stop in our tracks. After all, are we not supposed to honor our father and mother? Then I did a little research. And I found out, as I expected to, that it was an expectation in that culture that people should honor their father and mother and they should bury their father and mother. But in further research, I found out that the phrase, to bury my father, was not an uncommon phrase at that time, and it was really a way of saying something like this. When my father and mother die, and I bury them, then my responsibility to them will be fulfilled, and then I can do something else. So in this case, the traveler's father may not have been already dead. Jesus is telling that second traveler, the person he called to follow him, even as important as it is to honor your father, your parents, proclaiming the kingdom of God, being Jesus' disciple, is not a second job, it's not a hobby, it's not something we do once a week. To let people know of God's blessing upon them is of highest priority. The third traveler, like the first, offered to follow Jesus, but he wanted to say goodbye to his family and friends first. And Jesus told him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, The earth, the soil in Palestine is rocky. And if you're going to go out and plow a field, you're going to get yourself in trouble if you don't keep looking forward. Now, the least of which could happen is a crooked road and the ridicule of your neighbors. The worst might be an oxen's broken leg, a cracked plow, or personal injury or death. If you're going to do the job right, you have to follow the fixed point and focus on the task ahead. No turning back. So far, this is some of what we've learned about discipleship. God is sovereign and proclaiming his message is top priority. Those who follow Disciples serve God in dependence, relying on God's providence. The stakes of discipleship are high, and we have to trust God. When God calls, we must take it seriously. Everyone is called. One day a young woman was walking home from work, when she saw a little girl standing in the street corner, begging. The little girl's clothes were paper-thin and dirty, her hair matted and unclean, her cheeks red from the cold. The young woman dropped a few coins in the begging bowl, gave the girl a smile, and walked on. As she walked, she started to feel guilty. How could she go home to her warm house with its full pantry, with a well-supplied wardrobe, while this little girl shivered in the street? The young woman also began to feel angry. 
angry with God. She let her feelings be known in a prayer of protest. God, how could you let this sort of thing happen? Why don't you go and do something to help that girl? And then, to her surprise, God answered. He said, I did do something. I created you. Everyone is called. Some of you may already know this, but let me share this with all of you. I was a monk for a number of years in my early adulthood. And when you become a monk, you have a choice to change your name. It's kind of like a symbol of a new life. And also, you don't want everybody in the monastery to have the same name. Well, a long time ago, the abbot chose your name. But at this time, you could choose. So I gave it a lot of thought. And I finally decided on the name Zacchaeus. Zach. And I chose that name because, like me at the time, and still today, I am looking for a closer relationship with God. And according to the Gospel writer Luke, Zacchaeus climbed a tree looking for Jesus. And in the process, he found out it was Jesus who was looking for him. So, Jesus called him out of the tree. It was Jesus who was looking for him the whole time. And Jesus called me out while I was seeking him. And what brought me to the monastic life and what brought me where I am today is the same. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was reading the first letter of John in the Bible, and I was struck by these words. God is love, and the person who abides in love abides in God, and God in him or her. From that time forward, I have been seeking to be the best lover I can be. And I fail at times, but I still journey on. And because I know that when I seek to be the best lover that I can be, that I will be there with God. In seeking, I have found that being a disciple of Jesus is the only path to follow. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, said, Ever since we heard of this, your love in the Spirit, we have been praying for you unceasingly and asking that you may attain full knowledge of his will through perfect wisdom and spiritual insight. Then you will lead a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every way. You will bear fruit in good works of every sort and grow in the knowledge of God. We have come to know that disciple consists of knowing to be like Jesus, we must read and study scripture. Walking in the way Christ is leading us, we must become increasingly who God has created us to be through learning, praying, meditating, and discerning our spiritual gifts. Doing God's work by bearing fruit in every good work, we must exhibit the presence of Jesus, witnessing to God's glory in Christ by proclaiming the good news and by ministering in love to all of God's children. Growing inside out as we not only proclaim the kingdom of God, but live it, no matter the cost. A World War I chaplain, Jeffrey Studert Kennedy, wrote this. Nobody worries about Christ as long as he can be kept shut up in the churches. He is quite safe inside. But there's always trouble if you try and let him out. Will Campbell, a Baptist minister and a civil rights activist, an award-winning writer based in Mississippi in the 60s and 70s. Campbell's prophetic ministry earned him death threats and opposition. 
as well as helping others gain insight into what it truly means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. As a Baptist minister, Will was familiar with the practice of the altar call, where people are invited to indicate to their response to Christ by walking to the front of the church and giving testimony or being prayed for. Yet in a sermon, Campbell once turned the idea of the altar call on its head. He said, I hope that someday there will be an evangelistic service in which when the preacher gives the invitation and people start coming down the aisle, he yells back at them, Don't come down the aisle. Go to Jesus. Don't come to me. Go to Jesus. Upon that declaration, the people who were coming down the aisle turned around, exit the church, get in their cars, and drive away. Then he yells at the rest of the congregation, Why are you hanging around here? Why don't you go to Jesus too? Why don't you all go to Jesus? The people rise en masse and quickly leave the church and soon the parking lot is empty. And what he imagines next is that about a half hour later, the telephone at the police station starts ringing off the hook and the voice at the other end says, we're down here at the nursing home and there's some crazy people at the door yelling that they want to come in and visit Jesus. And I keep telling them, Jesus isn't there. All we have here are a bunch of elderly folk in need of care. But they keep saying, but we want to visit Jesus. We want to visit Jesus. The next call is from the warden down at the prison. He's saying, send some cops down here. There's a bunch of nuts at the gate. And they're yelling and screaming, let us in there. We want to visit Jesus. We want to visit Jesus. I keep telling them that all we have in this place are drug dealers, murderers, rapists, and thieves. But they keep yelling, let us in. We want to visit Jesus. No sooner does the cop at the desk hang up the phone, it rings again. This time it's the superintendent of the state hospital calling for help. He's complaining that there are a bunch of weird people outside begging to be let in. They, too, want to see Jesus. And the superintendent says, I keep telling them Jesus isn't here. All we have here are patients with emotional difficulties and mental illness. But they keep yelling at us, we want to see Jesus. What Reverend Campbell's fantasy um, doesn't include is that in the congregation's actions, is that they only have to look in a mirror as well, because then they will also find Jesus. In John's Gospel, we read, It is the glory of the Father that you should bear much fruit, and this will prove you are my disciples. I commissioned you to go out and to bear fruit, fruit that will endure. And what is this fruit that will endure? Love. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, love never ends. Discipleship is learning and becoming and being so much in love that you would do anything, even unto death, to keep those we love safe, secure, happy, and whole. Because we know that those who love us feel the same way. Can our relationship with God be anything less than this? For it is God who loved us first. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Elisha was called to be a prophet. He answered, Peter, Paul, Andrew, James, John, and all the apostles and disciples were called. They answered. When we choose to follow Jesus, like the first and third traveler in the gospel, 
we find out soon enough, like the second traveler, it was God all along who had already chosen us. Like the hog, we have to be willing to give our total commitment to discipleship. When we choose to follow Jesus, we find out the path is not a walk in the park. Following in Jesus' footsteps is at times steep. Sometimes we have to plod through the mud and muck. And sometimes we're beaten down by others along the way. When we choose to follow Jesus, like the apostles in the early churches in Colossus and Corinth and Jerusalem and Rome, we find out soon enough that we're not alone. The Holy Spirit and our companion disciples are walking with us, sharing the work, comforting us, supporting us, encouraging us, keeping us focused as we plow towards the fixed point. Because in the end, our commission as disciples, that fixed point, the kingdom of God we proclaim, is not complicated or hard to understand. We are to proclaim in word and in deed that God is with us, that God loves us, that we are to love God, and we are to love our neighbor. And as Reverend Cramble might say, there's no going back when we go to Jesus. Discipleship, after all, is a love relationship. Amen? Amen. If you'll pray with me. Holy Spirit God, in your season of hope and enlightenment, Be with us as we pray in thanksgiving and petition. We pray for all those gathered in Orlando for the MCC General Conference that their prayers, meetings, and discussions bear great fruit. We pray that we continue to receive your blessings as we celebrate our lives as you have created us to be and that all people may be proud to be one of your daughters or sons created in your image. We pray for this country that as we come to celebrate the 4th of July that the blessings you have given us that they may continue to give us the strength and hope and joy in our life that we may also share that with others. We pray for all those who are hurting this day that you may bring them hope, comfort, and restore them to wholeness. We pray for those things unspoken here but in our hearts in petition to you. As in all things, let us praise and thank God and give him all the glory through his son Jesus. Amen. And now if we'll take a moment of silence to consider how the Spirit is filling our hearts. Amen.